Tong child and for Mrs. Plez that the, the dentition is the first thing to change, the diet is the first thing to change, which then allows the brain to start changing. Now we see this. Now everything that happens in the jaws and the dentition affects what happens on the top of the skull and the morphology of the top of the skull. So what we can see, a very nice example of this, is we can see a chimpanzee. Now, in order for the muscles to be powered, what happens is the muscle from the jaw, the, the jaw to be powered, comes up through and attaches to the top of the head. Now in humans, we have the most delicate of all of the, the primate jaws. And we can see this by the temporal line. We can see this line that comes here. And you can feel it when you clench your jaw. You can feel where the muscle for your jaw attaches to your head. And it creates this temporal line. Now in a chimpanzee, we can see the line is a lot further up. And it causes this, this constriction here. Now these lines, because a chimpanzee uh, requires a more powerful jaw, these lines are further up the skull. Okay? On a gorilla, which requires a massive, powerful jaw for reasons of sexual dominance, much like this, this is not a gorilla, by the way, this is a paranthropus, but a similar oh, wow. morphological features of paranthropus, I'll talk about them just now. Uh, the, the muscles required to power this jaw, this huge, massive jaw, are so strong that it actually comes up through these uh, zygomatic arches and attaches to the top and it constricts and it pushes up to create this sagittal crest. Now, as the, the diet changes, and we suspect uh, Australopithecus afarensis and Australopithecus africanus, much like Mrs. Plez and Littlefoot, the, there's an increased ingestion of protein. Now, protein over many thousands of generations, which takes evolution that long to start to change, starts to pull down and starts to create a more de delicate jaw. Because it doesn't require the processing of leaves and heavy fruits, uh, seeds and grasses and things like this. And what happens is this temporal line, these temporal lines start to reduce. Now we can see it in Homo agaster, where it comes down from Mrs. Plez. Homo habilis, where it's a little bit higher, so we can still see it coming down, coming down to the point where we get to where we are now. Now this has allowed this part of the brain to grow. Now the frontal lobe is where we, where we think of all modern human behaviour as residing. All of our judgement, all of our time planning, uh, our complex thoughts, abstract, uh, even some of the language, comes around this, this frontal lobe. And it's the expansion of that frontal lobe via, via the ingestion of protein over millennia that allows uh, us to really, really thrive and start to influence our environment instead of the environment influencing us. So when you see all of these, these specimens with these huge brow ridges, it's not so much that the brow ridge uh, disappeared or reduced, it's more that the brain was allowed to expand. From the reduction in the jaw muscles, comes down, restricts the brain growth much less and allows this frontal lobe to expand to a point that we are at the moment. Now, there are many species that we find in the cradle. Uh, we find, for example, we find Homo habilis, which is the first species we uh, think of as, as creating stone tools. We see Australopithecus, and we also see this guy. Now, this guy is called Paranthropus. Now, they are extremely different, and they look, but immediately, they look extreme, very different. These guys have about the same brain size, and so we suspect the same sort of cognitive ability. But they specialise, they live at exactly the same place in, uh, in and around Stofenheim, but they specialise in very different environments. Paranthropus is much more specialised in, in the savanna land, surviving in an area where it's eating heavy tubers, uh, the grasses. And because of that, it needs this huge dentition. Now you can see these, these molars, even the canines are worn down to a very flat premolars. Everything is extremely flat and built, designed. Uh, to efficiently process grasses and, and these, these heavy starches. And of course, because of that, then you need this jaw, which attaches and creates this constriction on the top of the skull. Mrs. Plez is slightly different. We think Mrs. Plez was living much more like a chimpanzee, and that it was a frugivorous, so it was eating the, the shoots, the leaves, 
the fruits, everything on the trees, surviving in these little clusters of trees that were, that were around these areas. That's why we get so many Australopithecus at Stirkfontein, is because they were taking advantage of these concentrations of trees when they died or by accident, falling in and going in preserved in these, these caves below. Pranthropus, unfortunately, uh, at about two and a half million years, uh, sorry, about 1.6 million years, we see that the environment becoming a little bit more damp and moist. And what that allows is, is the forest to start growing, the savanna land to start restricting, and Paranthropus really does start to come, come into competition with itself and the um, other hominids. And we find this uh, on things like the Paranthropus mandible. This is not the one, but we see cut marks here. Uh, the reason why you cut here is to remove the jaw. Uh, and what you do is you cut the masseter, the masseter tendons, which connect the jaw to the, the cranium, you take it off, and you get to the brain. Now, the brain is the most nutritious part of any species, and any hunter will, will focus on the brain above and beyond any other kind of muscle or meat. So we know that Paranthropus was being preyed upon by Homo habilis, because Homo habilis we, we find the first stone tools with. So all of these three were interacting exactly in this area, around this river, the Blaubank, which ties all of these, these cradles, most of these cradle sites in, and they all come together at this point, and we get all three of these specimens buried in the deposits here. So it's a very exciting time and a very exciting area to be working in. That increased protein you're talking about, you're yeah. talking about meat, eating other hominids, as well as eating... Well, more like meat. opportunistic scavenging uh, on, a, on a much greater level. We know chimpanzees, they, they do eat meat. We know they actively hunt, but it's very rare. So we, we suspect that Mrs. Plez was taking that to another level, and because of maybe a larger uh, sort of social grouping, uh, we're able to take advantage of, of scavenging. Maybe we're using uh, wooden tools and spears in order to fend off and, and create more opportunities to, to ingest meat. Uh, that protein ingestion is what we suspect really started to take it on to, and allow the brain growth that, that takes millennia. To, to happen. But, but not a hunting like? No, a not a hunting like. The first uh, real evidence we have of, of active hunting would come in even after Homo habilis. Homo habilis, which we see coming in at about 2.5 million years, really also wasn't a hunter. We suspect the first hunting was conducted by Homo ergaster, which is where we see the first stone tools really created uh, for hunting. Uh, that is, like, uh, hand axes and things like this for the processing of, of multiple things. Specialist tools for specialist jobs. Beforehand, technology was much more based around uh, opportunistic uh, expedient use, so they would create whatever they would need to, to process whatever wood or carcass they were on. They'd throw everything away and they would move on. As Mr. Augusta comes in at about 1.6 million years, then we see uh, a marked shift in technology towards much more specific job-related tasks and tools.